Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. We're going to take a look at an event that's recorded in all four Gospels. It's Jesus' cleansing of the temple. But as you probably know, it's recorded differently in a different sequence in John than it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So in John, it fronts his Gospel. It's at the beginning in chapter 2, whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke place it at the end during Passion Week. So John has a little bit different purpose in arranging his events the way the way that he does. Now, each of these gospel writers recorded, of course, a little bit differently, even Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they all kind of focus on different biblical verses that provide a background and impetus for why Jesus does what he does. Now, we're just going to focus exclusively upon what John says, and what we're going to do is take a look, of course, at how John records this, but we're also going to take a look at two Old Testament verses that are going to provide the necessary background to understand why Jesus does what he does. One of these is Psalm 69, a very, very influential psalm in the New Testament. It's quoted several times. It's alluded to even more times. The other, not quite as obvious, it's more of an illusion, is the very last verse of the prophet Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 21. And both of these together are going to provide the necessary background to understand exactly what Jesus is doing. I mean, that's really the question, right? Why does Jesus cleanse the temple? Why does he overturn the tables and the money changers? Why does he drive out the animals? Why does he say what he says? It's more than he's just mad. He's not just angry about something. He's not just kind of being a wild rabbi and causing this ruckus in the temple. There's a purpose behind this. In fact, I would argue that rather than depicting Jesus as somehow angry, we need to focus upon the only real emotional kind of word that's referenced in the Gospels, and that is not anger. Instead, it's zeal, or in the Hebrew, zeal or jealousy. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's first of all look at the first few verses, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about who money changers are and what the animals are doing there, and then we'll investigate the Old Testament background. Okay, so John 2, 13 through 17. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Okay, first of all, this is a picture, a depiction of the temple in Jerusalem. And you can see, of course, the temple proper, and then the court of the priest directly in front of it, then the court of the Israelite men, the court of the Israelite women, and then that, that farthest court is the court of the Gentiles, which is probably where these events took place. This is probably where the money changers and the animals were located. Now, you might be asking yourself, what were these animals doing in the temple? And what was the purpose of the money changers? Well, real briefly, the animals were there because, okay, say you're a Jew, first century, and you live maybe up in Galilee, or you live outside Judea, and you're making a pilgrimage for Passover to Jerusalem. You do not want to take your animal with you that you're going to sacrifice. It's difficult enough to journey in the ancient world without taking animals with you. So what do you do? Well, you take money with you. And then when you get to the city of Jerusalem, you purchase the animal there that you're going to sacrifice at the temple. It's just a practicality. That's all. So these animals were there for those who wanted to offer a sacrifice. They would buy it. They would sacrifice it. Secondly, the money changers. John uses three different words that are connected with money changing. The reason the money changers were there is because certain currency was not accepted there in the temple. If a Jew was coming to pay the the annual tax, the annual temple tax, the half shekel temple tax, then oftentimes they would need to exchange the currency of their province, wherever they were from, for currency that was accepted in Jerusalem. Oftentimes, if you were a pilgrim, you would bring larger currency with you, and then when you got there, you would trade it for smaller currency. Of course, we still do this today. If you travel from America to Europe, perhaps you change your dollars for euros, or if you travel from any country to another country with different currency, well, then, of course, you have to make exchanges. You have to get their currency. It was really no different in the city of Jerusalem. You had to get the currency accepted there at the temple. Now, John uses, as I say, three different words to describe who these money changers are. One of these is kermatistes. 
Chromatistes is from the verb meaning to cut smaller or make smaller. So basically, the chromatistes gave smaller change for larger currency. That's the name itself indicates why they were there. Secondly, you have the word kolobistes. And this is from kolobos, which is a word for a small coin. So kind of like that too. They were giving smaller coins in exchange for the bigger coins. They were making change. The third of these is interesting. It's trapezites. Trapezites. And this is from trapeza, which is the Greek word for table. Of course, Jesus overturns these tables of the money changers. This particular kind of furniture was, it was so associated with the bankers or the money changers that that's how they got their name. Same with the Hebrew. The Hebrew word for table is shulchan, and the Hebrew word for a banker or a money changer was a shulchani. So they both get their names from, in the Greek and in the Hebrew as well, they get the names from the word for table. Okay, so Jesus says, when after he does all this, pours out the coins, makes the whip of cords, drives out the animals, drives out the money changers, he then says, don't make my house, my father's house into a house of trade. Now, this is where we get to a very interesting allusion to an Old Testament passage that is, is very easily missed. The passage is Zechariah chapter 14, verse 21. Let's look at it. So, Zechariah 14, 21 occurs at the very end of the book, and it says, There shall no longer, this is talking about the day of the Lord and the changes that are coming and how holiness is going to be pervasive. Well, I'll explain that more in a minute. And Zechariah ends by saying, There shall no longer be a traitor. The Greek, I mean, the Hebrew there is kana'ani. There shall no longer be a kana'ani in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. End of book. Now, what is a kana'ani? Well, the Hebrew word itself just means Canaanite. I mean, it's an ordinary word for Canaanite. However, in a few passages, such as this one, it means a person who's a merchant, someone who engages in commerce, a trader. So, Isaiah 23, verse 8, talks about the traders from Tyre, the Canaanite. Proverbs 31, 24, we're familiar with this because of the Proverbs 31, wise woman, right? Well, what does she do? One of the things she does is she delivers sashes to the Kana'ani, to the merchant. Job 41, 6 says, will they divide Leviathan up among the merchants? Again, Kana'ani. And even when the, the Hebrew was paraphrased into Aramaic and recorded in what's called the Targum, there we have the word Trans, for, for the translation or the paraphrase of Canaanite, we have Aved Tigra, which means those who are engaged in business. In other words, what was going on was you had these traders, these merchants, these Kanaani in the temple, and Zechariah prophesies a day when they are no longer going to be there. There's not going to be merchants, there's not going to be traders, there's not going to be those engaged in commerce anymore on this coming day of the Lord. And what's going to happen on this coming day of the Lord? Well, let's look at it in context. I know we've talked about this many times, but I'll say it again. This is what's called metalepsis, where a New Testament writer will allude to an Old Testament text, and he expects you not to just kind of look at that one particular text or part of a text, but the entire context. Well, what is the context of Zechariah 14 and this idea of there being, being no longer merchants or traders in the temple? Well, here's what we have. On that day, there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to Yahweh, holy to the Lord. And the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall no longer be a kana'ani, a traitor a person of merch, of, of business or commerce in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Now, you might be saying to yourself, I don't, what's going on? What's all this talk about bells on horses and pots and, and this kind of stuff? What Zechariah is talking about is that there's going to be this expansion, almost you might call it a democratization of sanctification, where holiness is pervasive. It's no longer the the pots that a Jewish mother uses to boil meat in her home are going to be just as holy as the pots used in the temple. And the bells on the horses, they're going to have holy to the Lord on them, the same words that are inscribed on the, 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 the plate of gold that's on the, the forehead of the high priest. 
what Zechariah is saying is, listen, there's coming, there's coming a day when the boundaries of holy space are going to be eroded, going to be crushed, going to be done away with, and this holiness is, as it were, going to ripple forth from the temple to pervade the land so that what was originally only holy in the temple is going to be holy way outside the temple. Common utensils are going to be just as sacred as the utensils used in the temple. And all of this is going to occur simultaneously when, when there's no longer going to be a merchant, a person of commerce in the Lord's temple. Now, you might be saying to yourself, okay, but how, how does this all fit with what Jesus does? Well, we're going to find out, just to, to kind of jump ahead, what Jesus does by his crucifixion and resurrection is he then erects a new kind of temple, his own body. And it was, as a result of that, Holiness and sanctification pervades the entire creation. Wherever Christ is and wherever his ministry is taking place, that's what, that's what Zechariah sees. And that's what's going to happen in the resurrection of Jesus, where you have this pervasive holiness that's going to fill creation, where holiness and sanctification are no longer going to be geographically situated at the temple in Jerusalem. The kingdom is going to expand. So, it's very important to realize that Jesus is making this reference back to Zechariah 14, alluding to that because he, in that way, is pointing to the fulfillment of this prophecy that's going to take place in him. Okay, now we have one more Old Testament verse that's quoted here, and it's in reference to zeal, this jealousy of, of the Lord. And the verse is Psalm 69, where it says, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, once more, let's look at the entire context. If you look at all of Psalm 69 leading up to these verses, it's pretty fascinating because the person who prays this, the person who prays this is, is in dire straits. It's not so much that he's angry or that he's upset. He's threatened. His life is in danger and he's being mocked. He's being persecuted. He thinks that he's, he's about to be killed. And yet he says, zeal for your house consumes me. Here's the immediate context of that verse. This is verses 8 through 12. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's sons. So we see how he's been, he's been cut off from those who are near to him. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit at the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. So that's kind of the, the, the aura that surrounds the psalmist as he says these words. It's not so much that he's angry as he's being persecuted. And at the same time, within him burns this fire of what in Hebrew would be called kinah. So kinah is like jealousy or, or zeal. It's a word that occurs very frequently when talking about how the Lord is jealous or zealous for his people. Phineas, that famous priest, was jealous or zealous for the Lord. So this zeal of the Lord is what's being talked about here, this 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 loving jealousy of God where he wants his people to be his own and not give their hearts to other, other kinds of gods. That's what's happening in the ministry of Jesus. The zeal of his own divine nature, the zeal, the, the, the jealousy of him being God is being displayed here when, as a man, he drives out these money changers. He pours out the coins because he wants his house to become the place that he want, that he has planned for it to be. Now, as we're going to find out in just a minute, what's happening at that house, the temple, is only a foreshadowing what's going to happen to another house, to his own body. Let me point out a couple things about Psalm 69 outside of this particular verse. It's, it's a very, it's, I think it's a more important psalm than most of us realize in the New Testament. There's close to 15 possible allusions or quotations of Psalm 69 in the New Testament. We have this one where the, we talk about the zeal of the Lord. But the, the, another, the, ha, the second half of that verse about the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me, that's quoted by Paul in Romans 15.3. Psalm 69.21 about giving 
poison for food and for my thirst, giving me sour wine. That's alluded to by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the crucifixion of Jesus. Psalm 69, 22, let their own table before them become a snare when they are at peace. May it be, let it become a trap. Paul quotes that in Romans 11. And then finally, Psalm 69, verse 25, may there can't be a desolation, let no one dwell in their tents. A version of that is quoted in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, in reference to Judas Iscariot. So just think about all the events that are either referenced or, or alluded to in Psalm 69, everything from the cleansing of the temple to the crucifixion of Jesus to the replacement of Judas Iscariot. Psalm 69 is a crucial psalm that tells us a lot about who the Messiah is, and what kind of ministry in which he engages. Okay, let me point out one more thing before we look at the second half of the gospel reading, and it's this. If you look at a text called the Songs, the Psalms of Solomon, which many scholars date to the first century B.C., we have an indication that there was this Jewish expectation in the first century of a king, the son of David, who would come and would purge or cleanse Jerusalem. So let me read you a couple of verses from the 17th of the Psalms of Solomon. See, Lord, and raise up for them their king, the son of David, to rule over Israel, your servant, in the time which you choose, O God. Undergird him with the strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to cleanse Jerusalem from Gentiles who trample her to destruction. So this, there's this idea in this psalm, which probably predates all of this, of a coming son of David, this new king who's going to come and he's going to purge the temple. Just like we have oftentimes in the Old Testament, when a new king would, would take his throne and he often had to purge the abuses of idolatry from some of his predecessors, sometimes his immediate predecessor. So now when this new king comes, when the son of David comes, he himself is going to engage in the same. The king comes to his temple in order to cleanse that temple. So that's what's one more thing that's going on when Jesus cleanses or purges the temple. Okay, let's look at the second half of this verse, second half of this passage from John 2. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, as it turns out, this talk of destroying the temple that we have in John chapter two is gonna come up all over the accounts about the crucifixion of Jesus. So this is just a, a screenshot from Logos Bible Software where destroy and temple are used in the same context. So Matthew 26, we have people saying of Jesus, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And then the chapter after that, Matthew 27, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Mark, 5, Mark 14, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And in three days, I will build another not made with hands. Again, Mark 15, those who are passing Jesus on the cross are deriding him and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Then John chapter 2, verse 19 is the last one of these, the one that we are looking at. So this, this statement of Jesus comes up very frequently in the Gospels. It's going to be hurled at Jesus when he's on the cross. It's going to be used by these false witnesses in this, uh, this trial, this pseudo trial that they use to convict Jesus to convict Jesus. So it's going to come up frequently as an accusation that's leveled against him. Now, what is the impact of this? What is Jesus really communicating to us when he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it? Well, there is actually a ton. Let me very quickly summarize some of the implications of what Jesus is saying when he compares his crucified body to a destroyed temple and then his resurrected body to a rebuilt temple. The first of these is that Christ's body has become, will become, the focus of divine punishment when he's destroyed. You see, when the temp, the language of the temple's destruction is inextricably linked with 
the Babylonian destruction in 586 BC, which happened as a result of the sin of the Israelites. So when Christ's body is destroyed, when his temple body is destroyed on the cross, this is him taking that punishment into himself. And so the 586 destruction becomes a foreshadowing of what happens when our Lord is crucified. Secondly, the resurrection becomes the fulfillment of these prophetic expectations, like Ezekiel 40 through 48, of a new temple. Those last chapters of Ezekiel portray in great detail this eschatological, this end time temple that's going to be rebuilt. Well, Jesus, in comparing his resurrection to this rebuilt temple, is going to give us the insight by which we can read those last chapters of Ezekiel. So, Ezekiel 40 through 48 is basically this long, drawn out prophetic portrayal of what the implications are of our Lord's resurrected body. Thirdly, there is a radical reorientation to the, of the location of holiness and access to God in the body of Jesus. So in the Old Testament, I wrote an article about it this, this week, by the way, you can check it out, What is Sanctification? You can find it at the 1517.org website where I expand on this, this idea of holiness in the Old Testament. But the basic idea is this, in the Old Testament, holiness is geographically centered in the temple, where God is. So where God is located, that's the holiest place. And then there are degrees of holiness that radiate out from that. Okay? Well, what do you have in the New Testament? Well, now you have this reorientation. Where is holiness now? It's in the body of Jesus Christ. He is the holy of holies. So where Jesus is, there is the temple. Where Jesus is, there is the location of holiness. That's where our access to holiness is found. And then lastly, there's this universalization of the availability of God's saving presence. And we see that reflected in Zechariah chapter 14, where you have the, the bells and the horses just as holy as the, the, uh, the plate on the head, the forehead of the high priest, and the cooking pots of mom at home are just as holy as the cooking pots at the temple. And so sanctification spreads. Holiness ripples forth from the temple because wherever Christ and his gospel and his kingdom are present, their holiness is accessible to all who believe in him. Okay, so that's a quick run through. Uh, hope that's been helpful to you. There's, a, there's so much that is packed into these few verses of John that it's difficult to cover in a short amount of time. But keep in mind, primarily Psalm 69, Zechariah 14. These two Old Testament passages are going to both be like beams of light that are going to shine upon John chapter 2 and help us to understand more clearly why Jesus does what he does. He's the new king who comes. He's the one who brings about this expansion of holiness. He's the one filled with the zeal, the, the divine jealousy to do the will of the Lord, even though that means he's going to suffer. And he's the one who then rebuilds the temple in his own body so that wherever we have access to the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, we have direct access to the saving holiness of the Father. Thank you so much for watching. If you found it helpful, share it with your friends. I hope that you're all doing well, and I pray God's richest mercy and peace upon each of you. We'll see you next week.